All right, one quick announcement. The people who had wanted to be added to DSpace and I didn't know how to do it, all you have to do is email me your, well, your email. All I need is your email address. So send me an email saying you want to be added to the DSpace roster and I will uh, put you on, okay? Uh, going back to what we're going to be talking about, the field of material science, hmm, get this out of me. The subject of material science can really be summarized in two sentences, and that's what we're going to be fleshing out. The properties of a material are determined by its composition, that's what atoms are in it, and its microstructure, which is how those atoms are arranged. The microstructure is the critical element, and that's determined by the composition and the processing that the material has received. We process materials to reconfigure their atoms, that is to give them a certain microstructure, so that they will have a particular set of properties. In the course, we're going to talk about, well, I'm going to talk about atoms today, then we'll show how we describe microstructure, and then talk about how that microstructure determines properties. So let me move right into that. The first thing we really need to talk about is bonding. If we're going to be discussing solids, and the materials we'll be talking about are almost exclusively solids, then we have to um, understand how they stick together. And this is a subject that most of you have encountered in your chemistry courses, maybe even going back to high school. So I suspect that a good part of what I will be telling you is review, but let's go through it anyway. Uh, there are some important properties of materials which can actually be inferred from the nature of the bonding itself. You don't really know, need to know much more than what kind of bonding is holding the atoms together in order to determine some of their properties. And I'll give you some examples of that today. We begin with the atoms. You know that the atoms are um, consist of nuclei and electrons. The electrons obey the Pauli exclusion principle, so I can only have one electron in each state. The states of an atom, or actually the spherical harmonics if you want, are characterized by four quantum numbers. The first is n, which is the orbit, and n can be any number, it's just an integer. The first orbit, the second, the third, and so on. Uh, for an atom electron in an orbit, the second um, parameter is its angular momentum. That gives us the quantum number L, and L can range from zero to n minus one. Each of the L states, the angular momentum states, is designated by a letter. S for angular momentum zero, T for angular momentum one, D for angular momentum two, three for angular momentum, uh, F for angular momentum three, and that's really all we have in, in, in the periodic table. Uh, each angular momentum has a Z component, and that Z component can range from minus L to L, giving us the total number, well, not quite the total. In addition, each electron has a spin, spin one half, spin minus one half. A set of four quantum numbers designates a possible state the electron can be in. They, in fact, are ordered in such a way that, of course, electrons will, in the ground state, electrons will fill these various states in the order of their energies. And the energies are, to at least the first approximation, ordered in the following way. The first two electron states are in N equals one and the S state. I then go to the n equals two states. There I can have s and t orbitals. The s orbital contains two electrons and t6. In the third orbit, n equals three, I have s two states, t six states, and then d ten states. However, in the hierarchy of energies, with a couple of minor exceptions, well, actually, not, it, it can be kind of important, but with a couple of exceptions, it turns out that the four s states have lower energies than the three d states. So these get filled first, and then the d states are filled to give you the, the various transition metals. All of this, of course, leads to the arrangement of elements in the periodic table. In the periodic table, we have s states here, hydrogen, um, helium, the n equals two gives us lithium and so on, n equals three, sodium and so on, and, and so on down the periodic table, as we gradually fill up the allowed electron states. Well, you, I'm sure you already know that from your earlier chemistry and physics, but let me get to what's important for material science. From the point of view of the behavior of materials or the bonding of atoms, it is possible to and, and, and useful to divide the electrons around the material into two sets. The first set consists of all of the closed shells, the filled shells of electrons that are there. For example, in carbon, which has, um, um, uh, which has six electrons, we have a filled 1s state, and then four electrons in the, uh, in, in the n equal two orbitals, which is not entirely filled. In silicon, we fill both the one and two orbitals, and it's the n equals three orbitals that are not entirely filled, and so on. Um, the closed shells of electrons, the orbitals that are completely filled, are relatively inert, not entirely, but relatively inert, and they rarely participate in bonding in any meaningful way. So for most purposes, when we visualize a material, we can look at it as consisting of two sets of electrons. The first set of electrons are those that are in the closed shell, these eight electrons in the case of silicon. Those closed shells, together with the nucleus, represent what we call the iron core. They behave almost like a rubber ball, you know, these, these, these electrons are not going to do anything, they're just sitting there. They're the core of the atom. Outside that core are these valence electrons. These are the electrons in the unfilled orbitals, and those are the ones that participate in bonding and, and uh, affect the various properties that the material has. So we're concentrating almost always on the valence electrons, which are out here. The one exception to that, well, the two exceptions, come in the transition metals, which have partly filled 3D states, and the rare earths, which have partly filled 4S states. Because these orbitals, being partly filled, sometimes behave like part of the core, and sometimes do participate in bonding, and in certain properties, in particular the magnetic properties of the material. So while I would ordinarily visualize iron like this, sometimes I have to recognize that this D shell is not entirely filled, and that there will be uh, properties associated with those new electrons. If I go all the way up to the rare earths, then I've got, a, uh, uh, I've got the, the, um, the, the four F states that are partly filled and that affect properties. Uh, an interesting exception to the usual filling of the electron states is in copper. Copper is at the end of the transition metal series, and uh, would, would be expected to have 3D9 4S2 configuration. In fact, because of the advantage in having a fully filled inner shell, it turns out to be energetically for copper to flip one of these S electrons into the 3D state to fill it up, leaving it with one S electron. And that is a very important thing in the history of the world, because this makes copper an outstanding electrical conductor, as we will see later, because of this behavior you know, at, the, uh, at the atomic level. Well, the bonding between atoms is almost exclusively due to the behavior of the valence electrons. There's a bit of an exception in the transition metals that we'll talk about, but for our purposes now, let's focus on the valence electrons. Bonding is electrostatic. What happens is, I have positive ion cores and negative valence electrons. Positive and negative charges interact with one another, and it is that electrostatic interaction that is responsible for the bonding of atoms. However, the bonding can be a bit complicated, and uh, there are, well, as with most things in material science and engineering, in fact, in physics and chemistry, the full solution to the problem of atoms hanging together through the interaction and the distributions of their electric charges is a very complicated one. 
We would like to simplify it using models that we can visualize, which allow us to describe the nature of the bonding and how that influences the properties of the material. It turns out that we use two different models, rather interchangeable, because they allow us to look at two different aspects of bonding that are, are sufficient for particular purposes. The first model is the one that I'm sure you saw back in high school, which is the chemist model, the old Pauling model. You uh, simply look at, you focus on individual bonds, and you look at how chemical bonds uh, are formed, which are imagined to be localized between the atoms. This is the model that leads to metallic bonding, ionic bonding, covalent bonding, and so on, which you've been hearing about for quite some time. We'll talk about that today. Uh, many of the properties of material, the interaction, the bonding, the chemical properties, can be understood in terms of that chemist model. However, many properties cannot. If we want to understand what's really going on in semiconductors, for example, yeah, you can torque the chemist model so it tells you, and I'll show you how to do that. But there's a much better model to explain the more complex electronic properties of material, and that I refer to as the physics model, which recognizes that the individual electrons in the material are not localized in bonds between individual atoms. They wander through the whole solid, and they sit in states that are spread through the whole solid, and these electron states are gathered into groups that we call uh, energy bands. And understanding the structure and behavior of electrons in those energy bands lets us clearly appreciate what's going on in semiconductors, for example, and in a number of other processes that go on in material, optical transitions, op optical properties, and so on. So let's start out with the chemist model, then we'll talk about the physics model. The um, interatomic bonding. If we go look at just a diatomic molecule, and an asteroid put a bond together, suppose we have an ion core and a single valence electron, and we bring two of these atoms together. Well, now, when the atoms are far apart, the electrons are attracted to their separate nuclei. As we begin to bring these atoms together, however, the electrons will begin to see the positive charge of the other nucleus and will have some electrostatic attraction to that, provided that the orbits of these two valence electrons can become correlated so that they can both see both of these nuclei. What happens is that the electron distribution will become concentrated in the space in between these two nuclei. In that way, these two electrons can have a favorable interaction with both of these nuclei that lowers the energy of the bond, that lowers the energy of the configuration, and causes these two atoms to bond together. And that's basically where bonding is coming from. If I have separate atoms, the electrons interact only with their own nuclei. If I bring those, those ion cores together, then the valence electrons can simultaneously interact with a number of nuclei and find configurations that let them lower their energy. Notice that for that to happen, the orbits of these electrons must become correlated with one another so that the electrons focus themselves and spend most of their time in this favorable position in between the two nuclei. That's basically the cause of bonding. The electrons see multiple nuclei, they interact with all of them, their potential energy decreases, and therefore they bond together. But to kind of understand how that leads to bonding, suppose that we have ion cores and electrons and we bring them together. The simplest bonding model, it's not a bad one, is the old London model, which says that the, uh, the potential of interaction between these two uh, atoms is the sum of two terms, and you can kind of see where they are. As the atoms come together, these two electrons sitting between the two nuclei will interact more and more strongly with the nuclei, and that causes the potential to go down. But now let's suppose that they get so close together that these uh, ion cores begin to overlap. Well, both of the ion cores include filled electron shells. Those filled electron shells cannot overlap in any meaningful sense, because if they were to overlap, we'd have to have two electrons in the same state, and we can't do that. The Pauli exclusion principle doesn't allow it. So if we get these uh, electron shells too close to one another, then they must, the orbitals must begin to deform. It's not a bad model to think of these as two rubber balls. If they get too close to one another, you can't have occupy the same space at the same time, so the rubber balls must begin to compress one another, and that's going to be erasing the potential. So we have an attractive term out here, which you can write. It's not a bad model, not a deal of R to the N. But you also have a repulsive term, which interacts at short range, so this number M, this power is much greater than N, and that uh, will cause repulsion if the atoms get too close together. The net result of the curve goes something like this. Here's the potential. It is attractive. Well, it, it, it is an attractive potential when the atoms are far apart. It is a repulsive potential when the atoms are close together. And it has a minimum right here at which the, uh, the equilibrium position of the atoms exists. If I take the derivative of the potential energy, I get the force that the atoms exert on one another. Now, right here, now this is slightly off drawn. This would occur at the minimum, the FDPDR is equal to zero. At the equilibrium position, the force, the atoms exert zero force on one another. They're at equilibrium. If I get them too close together, then the force is negative and they push one another apart. If I get them too far apart, the force is positive and they pull one another together. Notice that there is a maximum to the force they exert on one another. And this corresponds to, if you want, the, the breaking strength, the ultimate strength of this diatomic molecule. If I pull these two atoms together, I get a stronger and stronger and stronger force. I mean, I pull them apart. I get a stronger and stronger force trying to push them back and pull them back together again. But once I get to this point right here, that force has hit its maximum value. So if I exert a tensile force trying to pull the atoms apart, which is larger than that value of them, they're going to just fly apart. I, they no longer exert a force on one another that is sufficient to destroy them. So if you pull on the atoms, you, they behave like a spring. In fact, one of the problems I gave you for homework this week, when the displacement is very small, they behave exactly like a spring with a spring time. But if you pull them enough so that you exceed this distance right here and this force Fm, then they fly apart. So that is the breaking strength, the strength of the force required to break the strain, if you want, and separate these atoms once and for all. Well, that's the essence of bonding. If we go from a simple diatomic molecule to 10 to the 23rd atoms in some ordered pattern, essentially the same thing is happening. If we take those atoms and squash them together, they're attracted to one another until the volume per atom gets very small, and then they repel. So there is an equilibrium configuration. For small displacements, a solid behaves like a spring, elastically, as we will see later. But if you pull on it hard enough that you exceed its theoretical strength, it will fall apart. And this is, in fact, the highest strength that the, corresponds to the highest strength that a, that a solid could have, the so-called theoretical uh, strength of the solid. Okay, now let's look at the nature of bonding, and we'll use a chemist model. Now, all of the bonding is due to the fact that electrons are shared between the different atoms. There are, in fact, three ways in which that can happen. One way that we can, uh, we can have the electrons uh, uh, simultaneously interacting with different nuclei is to simply share them. Sharing electrons, in which sort of like the picture I gave you in the last slide, where we build up the electronic charge between the nuclei, gives rise to two different kinds of bonding, covalent and metallic. The reason that there are two different kinds of shared electron bonds with very different properties 
is that there are a limited number of electrons that can be shared because there are a limited number of available electron states that these electrons can, can occupy. If the electron is, is shared between the two atoms, it simultaneously occupies atomic states on both atoms. Since there are only a certain number of such states, there are only a certain number of electrons that can be shared. There are two possibilities that lead to very different results and very different properties. In the covalent bond, the shared electron states are saturated. All of the electrons that can be shared are shared. That leads to a saturated kind of bonding, which we call a covalent bond. In the metallic bond, there are many more available states, or at least some more available states, than there are valence electrons. So in this case, we have shared electrons, but the bonding is unsaturated, and I'll talk about the properties of that in just a moment. The second kind of sharing we can have is the so-called ionic bond. In the ionic bond, suppose we have two dissimilar atoms, and we take an electron from one, and we move it to the other, to create two different ions, a positive ion and a negative ion. These ions now have attractions to one another, electrostatic attractions, and they bond together because of the attraction of the positive and negative ions. This is the ionic bond, and is the bond that you find in, for example, sodium chloride and in many, many compounds. The third kind of sharing doesn't really involve any electron transfer at all. Suppose I have two different atoms or molecules over here. What can happen, and what always does happen, uh, only rarely with the dominant composition of bonding, but the orbitals of these different, the charge distribution on these two different atoms or molecules will become polarized. In some cases, like uh, polar molecules, they're all automatically polarized. In other cases, like isolated atoms, we simply have the valence electrons in their orbitals, and the valence electron orbitals of the two different atoms will become aligned together to create dipoles that interact. This is the so-called dipole bond or van der Waals bond, which uh, is, is in fact present in, in, in everything. Um, we'll talk again about that in a moment. Right, let's start out with the covalent bond. In the covalent bond, valence electrons are shared to fill the outer shell. The classic case of the covalent bond is silicon. Silicon has four valence electrons, and there are in the outer shell, because of the 1s2, 1s2, in this silicon, the 3s2, 3s2, 6, there are eight available atomic states. So if I have silicon atoms here with its four electrons, and if it has four neighbors with which it shares electrons, then there are a net of eight electrons around each silicon atom, and there is therefore complete saturation. In fact, the silicon atoms will come to be in a tetrahedral configuration, something like this. In the simple covalent bond, we share electrons so that we, the sharing of electrons and the number of nearest neighbors is in balance, so that all possible electron states are filled, and that number of states is eight per atom. Uh, classic examples, CH4, um, ethane, which is um, uh, a carbon with four hydrogen neighbors. The four hydrogens only have one electron, so this will fill the eight states of, of carbon. Uh, solids, we have carbon, silicon, and germanium, which are four electrons, the valence four. If they are in the structure, and you'll see later the, the, the natural structure, such that each atom has exactly four neighbors, then this produces a saturated bond. But there are other possibilities for covalent bonding. Consider, for example, gallium arsenide. Gallium has valence three, arsenic has valence five. The average valence is four. Again, if I put them in a situation where each atom has four nearest neighbors, and they fully share electrons, I'll saturate all the bonds. So this is covalent. Zinc sulfide. Zinc has valence two, sulfur has valence six. Again, the average number of electrons is four, so I can establish a covalent bond for the two by simply saturating those atoms. This first example is the basic building block of organic molecules, as you'll see later. Organic molecules uh, have a strong tendency to have covalent bonding within the molecule. And this is a simple possible example, carbon surrounded by four hydrogens. This is the situation in semiconductors, where we have a solid, four valence electrons, four nearest neighbors, the bonds are saturated. Let's look to the behavior. The electrical properties of covalently bonded materials, they are invariably either semiconductors or insulators. Now, why is that? Well, in order to conduct electricity, electrons must move through the material. But take this uh, two-dimensional representation of the situation in silicon. If this electron wants to move through the material, it has real difficulty doing that, because all of the adjacent orbitals are already occupied. The only way it could move through the material would be to get excited to some higher level orbital, which would allow it to move through the material. So that's going to be difficult. That's going to require some activation energy, depending on how big that activation energy is. If the activation energy isn't too big with a semiconductor, if the activation is big with an insulator. Carbon in the fourfold coordinated structure is diamond. Diamond is an insulator, very good one. Silicon in the fourfold coordinated structure doesn't require quite as much of an activation energy to, to uh, excite an electron, and it behaves as a semiconductor. Mechanically, the covalently bonded materials are, are inevitably hard and brittle. The reason is, in order to mechanically deform the material, I've got to move atoms with respect to one another. But this is a very, very, uh, uh, this is a saturated configuration. If I start trying to rearrange these atoms, then I'm going to perturb the electron cloud. But the electron cloud isn't malleable because all of these electrons are fixed in space. So perturbing this thing, I immediately have to call in high energy electron states to allow the electron cloud to adjust itself so that I have slightly different configuration. That's hard to do. As a consequence, it is a property of covalently bonded materials that they are hard, very difficult to deform, and they tend to be brittle, relatively easy to fix. And that's true even of diamond. Diamond is the hardest substance known, but um, I can't tell you how many um, unfortunate um, women in particular have learned that diamond is also very brittle. Uh, don't ever wear a diamond ring while washing the dishes. If one taps it just right on the hard ceramic, you suddenly have two diamonds instead of one. <laughs> but of course, that's the way they, they, they make diamonds in such beautiful shape. They cleave them. They fracture them.